what's the deal with Neon Genesis Evangelion? Um, I'm doing this panel because I, I've been asked this question personally of people at, uh, at, uh, at conventions. And I was like, that's a good question. It's, it's very relevant. Um, why is this show so controversial? Why do people talk about it so much? Why is it just kind of in the conversation so much? What made it kind of the, the, the big anime that it is and the big franchise that it is? Um, yeah, let's get into it. Um, hey, hey, good to see you all here. So yeah, so again, it's kind of... And Evangelion is interesting because on the one hand, it doesn't feel like a, a, like a, a massive franchise in the sense of like tons of TV series and movies and such. So there are a fair number uh, of those. Um, but it's just, it's kind of out there and doing its, uh, its thing. So it's, and like, people are constantly talking about it. So why would happen? Um, so to understand that, we're going to talk about um, four big historical trends that um, all kind of came together with Evangelion. Um, we're going to talk about the Japanese economy and what was going on there, kind of Japanese society in general. We're going to talk about the state of anime fandom in Japan uh, leading up to Evangelion. The state of mecha anime, particularly in Japan, because Eva is kind of a response to a lot of mecha anime things. And then we're going to talk, talk about the reputation of Studio Gainax, the studio that made Evangelion, uh, and how that was building up to, to that. And then we'll talk about the aftermath after all of that happens. So that's the plan here as we dive into um, Evangelion. So let's start by talking about Japanese society. Now, I want you all to kind of set your minds back. Imagine Japan in the 1980s. We're in Japan. It's the 80s. It's a wild time. There's a lot of stuff going on. It is, it is party time in Japan in the 1980s. Um, you know, World War II ended in the 40s. It took, you know, through the 50s and the 60s to kind of rebuild and get, get um, back on their feet. By the 80s, Japan is kind of taking over the world. Uh, they have a tremendous, tremendously growing uh, economy. They are buying land all over the world. Um, you know, people in the West are now copying Japanese businesses and the Toyota way and um, you know, all these companies, Sony and so forth, are just really, really massive. Um, and things are, are, are pretty great. You know, the, uh, uh, the stock index, as you can see, is um, looking pretty good throughout the 80s. <laughs> like that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a good trend to see in your economy if you're, if you're doing that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's party time. Everyone's having a, having a pretty great time. Um, Indeed, uh, Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, was considered quite prescient for the, um, all of the Japanese signage that you see in Los Angeles, all of the idea that kind of there's Japanese everywhere, because there was this idea that, yeah, Japan's just going to take over the world. Like, Japan's going to probably own a large percentage of, like, America within the next few decades. Uh, just that trend is pushing forward. And exactly, you know, every American household had you know, um, Sony VCRs and you know, whatever. Like it, it, the, you know, all the consumer electronics now were, were being made in Japan because they were really good at it. And they made a, a good job of that. So, yeah, and obviously Japanese cars had made huge inroads in, in the U.S. So it was a big deal. Um, then this happened. Um, you know, 70, 1970s, 1980s, 1990, and there's the... <laughs> things, things don't look great. Um... So, yeah, all of a sudden, all that growth vanishes. Now, it's worth noting here um, that um, you know, the growth just drops off. But it's not like Japan suddenly becomes a third world country, right? Or developing country, whatever you want to, whatever you want to uh, call it. Um, the growth drops back down. Um, Japan is still prosperous, but it's not boom time anymore. Uh, that's a big deal. It's really traumatic to be part of a society that is on like, this upward trend for literally decades and then suddenly see that kind of evaporate and feel like, wow, what do we do now? Like the goal for a long time was growth, expansion. You know, um, Japan had this idea of the ever expanding, the, the um, I'm getting the term now, um, the um, ubiquitous middle class, I think, was something along those lines. Yeah. They're like, 
everybody had this solid, not, 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 not massive, but like really solid standard of living. Um, and that was just getting better and better and better over time. And people were getting more and more, you know, household goods and such. And then suddenly that, that, that goal of constant growth was unsustainable. What do you do? How do you react to that as a society? Like, what is your goal now? So the average Japanese person was like not feeling super confident about like Japanese society, Japanese culture, Japanese direction. I shouldn't say society or culture. Um, about the, the direction of like the Japanese economy and the, you know, GDP and growth and what Japan was going to be in the future. It was a really weird time by the time Evangelion came out in the mid-90s. So that's kind of the cultural feeling at the moment, the sort of zeitgeist of uncertainty um, of where do we go from here. And all of the previous models don't work anymore, right? It was, it was, it was kind of the, the feeling of a lot of people. All right, so let's put a pin in that and then come back and t talk about anime fandom in Japan. So we have this weird zeitgeist going on in, in culture. How was anime trending in Japan? Um, throughout the 70s and 80s, um, otaku culture had been growing. And there, was, um, there were a significant number of otaku out there. They were doing their thing. Um, but it was primarily college-age young adult men who grew up on anime and were now looking for these um, more sophisticated stories. And so the thing is, anime, um, you know, beyond the kids' shows, which, yeah, you, 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 know, you had your, your Heidi, your, your Anne of Green Gables, your Daddy Long, whatever, you, know, you, you had your, your kids' shows out there and they made money, but the, the anime industry, if you will, was very much targeting these um, um, primarily male, young adult audience. Fairly small number, but they spent money like nobody's business. They were, you know, if you sold it, they would buy it, just straight up. Um, there's a story, I don't have a slide for it here, that when, um, uh, when rental, when uh, videotapes entered the market and you could actually, you know, rent um, uh, VHS tapes and beta tapes, in Japan, because folks didn't have generally a lot of like space in their homes, the rental market was really, really huge. Folks generally, generally did not have a big collection at home. Um, and so there were all these like rental uh, uh, companies sprung up. And so Otaku would call them up and say, I will buy your professionally produced VHS tape of Space Battleship Yamato for whatever you will sell it to me for. And they were like, these things are, like, these are professional grade. Like, we buy these for, like, $80. Yep. I'll pay that. Whatever it takes, I will, I will buy that thing. So, yeah, it was a big, big deal. Like, like, Otaku would pay through the nose for Otaku merchandise. So it was this fairly small number of people um, spending a lot of money. And that was really what the industry was, 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 was aimed at. Um, but it certainly was not mainstream. It was, it's still a very, very underground subculture in Japan. This screenshot is from Otaku no Video, um, which we'll get to later. Um, and that is kind of a, um, a humorous view of what otaku, being an otaku in Japan was like in the 80s. And you see, you know, folks camping out to see the latest anime film and people walking by and going, what are you doing sitting out waiting for a cartoon? Right? Like, the average person did not understand anime fandom. It was, it was not a thing. Um, and then this happened. Um, a man named Tutomo Miyazaki um, was discovered to have um, kidnapped several young girls and done very terrible things to them. And that's all I'm going to say about it um, uh, in detail. You can certainly Google Tutomo Miyazaki and find out all the lurid details, and I'm not going to put that in your brain. Um... He was, he was found out to have done this, and when the police raided his home, they discovered it was full of anime merchandise and posters and material all over the place. Like, the, the classic sort of otaku, uh, you know, den uh, lair kind of a thing. And um, worse, he was into Loli. Now, 
in the 80s, Loli had been growing as a part of anime fandom. Like, you could find this stuff everywhere. Um, because, according to Japanese law, that was not illegal. It is just a drawing. There's nothing illegal about a drawing. So, this came up, and this was a huge news story. This was the story du jour of the time, uh, quite understandably. And so, at a time when people saw this, saw that there were all of these um, anime fans, you know, in this sort of small subculture who were consuming this material, and at a time when you could walk into Comic Cat and just pick up doujinshi with certain contents in it, um, people reported that on the news. <laughs> people were like, this is a thing. Are we comfortable about this thing? Is that... Uh, so all of a sudden, anime fandom got mainstream attention. People knew this thing existed. Um, it did not make anime fandom necessarily bigger. But people knew what anime was, and they knew it was attracting an adult audience. They knew that young adults were watching this thing, and it had become more sophisticated. It wasn't just Kimba and Astro Boy and that kind of stuff anymore. It had kind of leveled up a little bit. So by the mid-90s, the average Japanese person is aware of anime as a more adult medium and is aware that there is a, um, there's a market for it, right? There, 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 there's money to be, to be made in this, in this industry. So let's move off that for a little bit, put a pin in that, not the most pleasant of things, but worth mentioning. Um, and let's move and talk about mecha anime. Um, what's the trends of mecha anime? So. You will find people who will sing the praises of the sophistication of mecha anime, and that is true. But if you go back, <laughs> um, early giant robot shows were boys' wish fulfillment series, right? Like it was my father slash uncle slash grandfather genius scientist gives me the keys to a giant robot, and I then go and stomp people with it, right? It's it's very much that. And I don't mean that negatively. That is a, a thing that kids like. It, it is a, you know, it's part of human nature to have that desire for that kind of wish fulfillment. It's the cowboy fantasy, all that stuff. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, but that was very much the, the tone. Bad things are happening with the, um, with, with a, a joystick and two buttons piloting this giant robot, you can defeat the evil and the world is saved. Uh, very much the, the, the tone. Um, that changed uh, in late 70s and early 80s with the arrival of Mobile Suit Gundam and um, Super Dimension Fortress Macross. So both of those shows very much changed the tenor of mecha anime, where, and in a lot of ways anime in general, where suddenly you had much more sophisticated storytelling, you had more nuanced characters, you had stories about wars that weren't simply good versus evil. It was two political sides who had different objectives and people were caught in the middle. Um, um, you had um, complicated things happening with the heroes and the villains in a lot of ways. Um, so suddenly mecha anime was able to tackle more sophisticated stories and they were really leading the way for anime in general. Um, most anime was not doing this. Shoujo was to, to, to an extent. Rose of Versailles was going in some really interesting directions at the time. Um, but in general, people, um, you know, mecha anime was, was considered kind of the, the leading edge, the bleeding edge of the more adult kind of stories in, in anime. And so um, as the 80s progressed, we see more variations on that. So, um, uh, the early 70s um, shows were very were almost always set in the modern day with aliens or mutated dinosaurs or something attacking Japan or the world and um, maybe near future and the, uh, of 1985 and the um, uh, the you know, the main character is fighting back against that with super science um, Gundam and Macross are very much set in the future and they are war stories just, you know, not quite space opera in, like, the Star Wars sense, um, necessarily, but very much big wars happening, people are dying right and left, that kind of a thing. Um, and we are kind of um, pieces in that, that chess game. Um, 
the eighties saw variations on on that. Uh, Pat Labor, uh, famously, uh, is a yeah, yeah absolutely um, uh, near future series about <laughs> robot cops. Basically, it's so giant robots that are uh, enforcing the law um, uh, in the near future. Uh, Armored Trooper Votoms is also a war story, but it's more focused on the trauma of the soldier, um, and more inspired by like, Vietnam War kind of stories that you're familiar with. So you get that kind of stuff going on. Um, or Battle of Dunbean is a fantasy giant robot series. So you have uh, Mecha with you know swords and out in the woods and fighting castles and fairies and all that kind of stuff. So it's all those kind of interesting kind of, kind of variations on stuff, all trying to tell um, um, stories aimed at an older audience. Pat Labor, for example, is still very much like a, uh, uh, like a workplace comedy, but it's definitely not aimed at, like, eight-year-olds, right? It, it, it's a workplace comedy, so it's a, it clearly aimed at an older audience. Votom's definitely not for kids. Um, so, yeah, so you saw those variations. But by the 90s, Mecca had gotten pretty samey. Um, I actually went up and um, looked up, like, l uh, lists of major Mecca franchises, and I couldn't find a lot in the early 90s. Um, some of the franchises were just kind of, Gundam was still kind of chugging along. Well, even Gundam was in kind of a drought in the early 90s. Um, and things had kind of become settled. There wasn't a lot more ground to cover in the mecha genre, it was kind of felt. You know, you got the, um, the Brave King Kaiser and the whole Brave series, which is kind of a Transformers-esque um, uh, uh, anime series. Uh, you got series like Matchless Raijin O, Kishin Core, um, stuff which de definitely had giant robots in it, but the the genre itself felt kind of moribund. Like, we know what we're doing. And it's not that, that, that Mecha was unpopular or that there weren't a lot of Mecha series. It's just that the, kind of the patterns had been set, right? This is what a Mecha anime series are. Here are the five different, you know, common variations on it, and we're going to do one of these variations. That was really kind of the feeling of mecha anime by the mid-90s. So that's kind of where we were in terms of the mecha side of things. All right, now let's talk about the studio that made Neon Genesis Evangelion, Studio Gainax. Some of you out there will, will know all about this, but I think it's worth noting. So Gainax got its start in the early 80s making fan films. Um, technically, if you're interested in this, um, um, there's a book called The Notenki Memoirs, um, which is by one of the founders of Gainax, um, and it kind of tells this whole story, but basically, there are a bunch of fans who started getting into selling, like, model kits and selling, basically, anime merchandise. Um, they knew what the fans wanted, and so they would uh, provide that, and they, they, they would make the deals with people to, to, to make the merch and then sell that. Um, they started a company called General Products, and started selling stuff, uh, which, by the way, is a Larry Niven reference, which is hilarious. Um, they, they, they sent him a letter. Um, imagine being a Japanese fan sending a letter to Larry Niven in, like, 1978 saying, can we use your name? <laughs> sure. Anyway, um, that's a whole other thing. Um, so th they were doing that. They started uh, helping out with uh, anime conventions in Japan and sci-fi conventions in general. And so that was, a, that was cool. And, uh, yeah, exactly. They knew the fans wanted bunny girls. Um, so um, they started helping out with, with conventions, and they thought, wouldn't it be cool to commission a short animation for these conventions? So they had contacts of various fans and folks, and they said, um, can, we, you know, can we pull together enough people to actually animate something for uh, DICON 3, one of the conventions, and later DICON 4? And so sure enough, they made a short, a short film for DICON 3. It was a little rough around the edges, but it, it was fun. And then for Daikon 4, they're like, they, they really wanted to plot all the stops to make a really cool short film, which, oh boy, they did. Um, Daikon 4 is still considered kind of this legendary uh, short fan film of just every conceivable um, sci-fi, fantasy, anime trope kind of all thrown together. Um, Star Wars, Star Trek, Yamato, um, um, Gundam, Alien, you name it. Like, it, it's all in there. It's a lot of fun. Um, and luckily, they were able to do this partly because the, the main person they pulled in to do this was a guy named Hideaki Anno. Um, and Hideaki Anno was already working in the anime industry. He, was, he actually had already worked on the um, Starship Troopers anime OVA. And yes, 
there was a Starship Troopers anime. Um, so he'd worked on that, and then he was actually working with, with Hayao Miyazaki on the film Nausicaa, The Valley of Wind. And the reason I'm showing this screenshot from Nausicaa and not of like any of the characters, the reason I'm showing The God Warrior is because Hideaki Anno animated The God Warriors. That was kind of his task on the Nausicaa film was to animate The God Warriors. And if you've seen Nausicaa and you've seen Evangelion, you might remember that when the God Warriors fire their beam, it's this cross-shaped thing when it comes out of their mouth. Ha ha, right? Like, doesn't that seem familiar? Uh, so yes, that was kind of where, where that, that, that initially came from. So yeah, um, um, Anno was, was already an established animator helping out with Nausicaa of the Valley of Wind, uh, and he was kind of the head animator on the Daikon 3, Daikon 4 um, productions. And so they knew, okay, we, we've got staff capable of doing animated productions. But at this point, they're just fans. Like, they're just doing these, these one-off projects. Um, but when, when all of this worked, when all of this kind of came together, um, the folks they were talking with in the anime industry, um, you know, to make all these, these, these products were like, oh... You could, you could potentially do animation. So um, they managed to get the financing together to make a film. And in 1987, they made uh, Royal Space Force, The Wings of Honey Mise. This is a very ambitious, independent science fiction film. <laughs> if you've ever seen it, you know their goal here was to create a whole alien world. You know, every aspect of culture of clothing, all of that kind of stuff is kind of reimagined from scratch. The way, you know, coinage is distinct. Clothing is distinct. You know, everything you can think of, it feels like you are very much not on Earth. And it's basically about a space race. Um, you know, think like 1960s space race in, on this, this alien world. So, very, very ambitious. It came out, not a big financial success for them, but... People were impressed. It was one of those things where, wow, these folks really shoot for the stars. No pun intended. Pun totally intended. Um, and uh, like, a really impressive accomplishment, whether the film is like, you know, the, the most wonderful thing in the world or the most perfect thing in the world. But really, really, really impressed a lot of folks. And again, folks were like, okay, you know, you deserve some attention. So later on, when they were talking to some... some, uh, some um, folks from a bank, I think, um, uh, and, and this is actually in the Tenki memoirs, uh, they talk about how they were, um, again, negotiating for funds for something or, or other, and the, the folks at this bank basically took them aside and said, hey, we just got pitched this anime project, um, and we're wondering if you we want to look at it. Um, it was pitched by this guy named Hayao Miyazaki, and he's not interested in it anymore. He's like moving on to other things. Would you be interested in taking on a Hayao Miyazaki? Yes, <laughs> basically. Um, so Miyazaki had this pitch for this Jules Verne inspired story, which, um, um, th these folks took over and turned into Nadia, the Va Nadia and the Secret of Blue Water, um, a 1990 anime TV series that they, they produced and made. And Nadia is interesting because in many ways it's a throwback to kind of classic anime. It is more in the style of those World Masterpiece Theater children's book kind of stories, but with a more modern fan twist to it. So the characters are a little older. There's a little bit of fan service sprinkled throughout. Um, there's a lot more. There's a lot more um, um, mecha going on. I mean, more in the sense of like there's submarines and transforming machines and all that kind of fun stuff that uh, that sci-fi nerds like to look at. Um, and so it kind of merged a lot of these trends. And that's totally not the, the captain from Macross in the background. I don't know what you're talking about there. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was this kind of very fun, big project that impressed a lot of people for kind of its scope and how well it was able to capture um, a lot of the, the tones of these things. And it managed to balance a lot of different things at once, of being this um, big action-adventure series, staying fairly light in tone, um, also having like some dark moments, all that kind of stuff. So again, very impressive. The problem was, these folks were otaku. They weren't necessarily great business people. Um, 
they were making money and they were making all these kind of deals for merchandise because, as I mentioned before, anime sold really well. Um, all it was it was hard not to make money selling otaku merchandise in the 1980s, basically. Um, you know, and, and because they were you know early movers and they they knew they knew who to talk to and all they had all the connections, like all that was going really well. But they were not you know um, making money hand over fist despite having successful projects. So by the mid 90s, Gainax was almost out of business. Um, they had a string of, of various things, including what I'm showing you a screenshot of here, Otaku no Video, which was kind of their uh, fan film about being an anime fan in the in, in the 1980s, uh, which is a, a lot of fun. Definitely worth worth checking out. If you ever go to Otakon, the anime convention, they show it every single year. Um, I believe at the beginning and the end. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, which is always fun. Um, so yeah, that, that is a that is very much kind of a uh, um, a look at what it, what it was like with with a bit of a parodic lens, I will admit. Um, some of those interviews are great. Um, anyway, so that was a big deal. Um, that they had had this string of um, artistic success and kind of fan success, but the money wasn't coming back into the studio. Um, the money was going towards other people who had put money into it. Right? They, they were not really doing well. So they were almost out of business by the mid-90s. So they decided to throw everything at the wall for one last hurrah. And they were going to kind of make an anime series, and it's like, well, if this doesn't work, we're out of business anyway, so we're just going to try it all. We're just going to do everything we want to do and do it all in one show. Um, and that was Neon Genesis Evangelion, and that happened. <laughs> and suddenly... Um, um, funnily enough, from... Um, Icon Four came. They, they animated the iconic image of the the um, the like globe explosion of you know the thing coming out. You ever seen that image? It all comes back to kind of that that shot. Um, and that is very much what, what Evangelion was kind of like at the time. Just this massive explosion. This show came out and was hugely hugely popular. Why? Well, let's look back at those trends. First off, Eva managed to capture that zeitgeist of Japanese uncertainty. Um, now, it's easy in these things to go back and kind of psychoanalyze, try to psychoanalyze, like, the Japanese experience. Bad idea. That never works, by the way. Like, anyone who tries to figure out, you know, this is what people thought back then. Like, you know, you can talk about general trends, but, you know, don't try to psychoanalyze other cultures. Um, but the, the, you know, it is well documented that Japan, um, um, you know, the average Japanese people felt a certain sense of loss in the mid '90s and this sense of loss of direction, and that is very much the tone of Evangelion. Shinji's thrust into the situation where he has to pilot this giant robot very directionlessly. He doesn't know really why he's doing it. Obviously, you're trying to save humanity, but he's not sure why he's there, why he's chosen to do this, and. Again, not to get too deep into it, but if you're a Japanese teenager or young adult being told, go through this incredibly intense schooling system, go work for these companies um, and work 80 hours a week for you know 40 years and you'll be guaranteed a job in retirement. Oh, by the way, companies are failing right and left. Oh, by the way, we don't know if any of these companies are actually going to be able to survive in 10 years. Everything is up in the air. You're going to feel a certain amount of uncertainty about your life, right? So there was that sense of where are we now? What, what should we be doing? And so that tone kind of fit nicely at the time. Um, but also more importantly, especially for the, for, the, for the fans, Eva very much referenced and subverted a lot of classic anime tropes and a lot of mecha tropes. So, for example, as mentioned before, in mecha, typically, the main character is given the giant robot by this benevolent father figure. Whatever is the opposite of benevolent father figure, that's Gendo Ikari. Um, you know, Gendo Ikari is just this, this complete psychopath. 
And that's one of the reasons I think the show was so popular at the time, because folks looked at that and said, why him? Why do they write the father figure to be this giant a-hole? Like, that's really interesting. That's, that's, that's an odd subversion of that trope. So all sorts of a- aspects of Evangelion are inversions of things. You know, the, the enemies are typically these, you know, the monster of the week, the, you know, the dinosaur sent by the, 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 bag, the lion robot, you know, all the, all the various, various forms. The angels are not that. They're these weird, unrecognizable, like, shape creatures, and no one knows where they come from. They, they seem to just kind of show up. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. So all of these different things were twists, that were, but they were recognizable twists. It wasn't just we're going to do something completely unrecognizable and completely um, you know, bizarre. Well, Evangelion can be pretty bizarre. But it, it, it was all clearly from the minds of people who knew mecha anime and were riffing on it. So that got the attention of both anime fans and all those Japanese folks who'd grown up watching Mazinger Z and Getter Robo and all those sorts of shows who were at least familiar with those tropes. They tune into an episode and they're like, what are they doing? Like, what on earth is this? I'm intrigued. Maybe I'll watch the next episode. Um, also, it should be pointed out, Evangelion has this fixation on psychology um, and diving into kind of the mental state of its characters. It is certainly not the first anime to do this. Um, it's certainly not the first mecha series to deal with the psychological state of its characters. But its kind of obsession with this was definitely definitely felt fresh, um, in at least within the, 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 the mecha universe. I would argue like Rose of Versailles is very similar to that, where there's a lot of just kind of internal what's going on inside these characters' heads. Um, and other shoujo series would do that as well. But in terms of mecha anime, that felt like an interesting kind of, 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 uh, of focus for a show, to, to dive into, into these heads to that level of extent. Um, so all that's going on, right? It's capturing a zeitgeist. It's um, playing around, riffing on sort of this jazz riff on mecha anime, um, while also being this sort of intense thing. And then something else happened. Um, oh, two things happened, actually. First... You, remember, you may remember a scene from, I think it's episode 20 of, of the Evangelion TV series, if you've seen it, where um, you pan around a room while you hear um, two characters having a conversation where they then proceed to um, very much enjoy each other's comfort, the, the comfort of each other's, you know, selves, intimately. Um, you don't see anything, but it's pretty clear what these two characters are doing with each other. Um, that prompted a bunch of complaints. Evangelion aired, I believe, Wednesdays, but I think it was in, like, a a regular, you know, like, evening time slot. So, kids would not necessarily have been in bed when this scene came on, and that kicked off a bunch of complaints to TV stations and so forth of, you know, what kind of smut are you showing, you know, and on, on your channel. Um, and... This ties into what we were talking about before with this idea that anime was now kind of growing up. That people were realizing, oh, anime is tackling these more mature subjects. Um, it is argued that the practice of putting anime on like really late night time slots like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. was a response to this specific event. Uh, that all these people complaining about this scene in Evangelion. Um, because people were like, oh, okay, this, this, is a, this is a thing now in anime. We cannot trust everything to be Kimba anymore. As weird as Kimba can be, um, sleeping on his dead father. Anyway, um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, so people were, were waking up to how adult anime could be now. Big deal. Um, and then this happened. Um, so there was a uh, religious cult in Japan called Aum Shinrikyo, one of many, you know, any society has any number of weird cults out there. And then one day in 1995, they released a bunch of sarin gas on the Japanese subways as part of this sort of apocalyptic plan. Um, I believe it was 13 people died. Um, hundreds were, 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 um, uh, were hurt. Um, it, was, it was bad. Um, it was a really big deal. Um, it, was a, it, it was, I believe, I may be wrong, I believe it was the worst 
like terrorist attack, um, certainly in, in the 20th century uh, in, in, in Japan, um, possibly ever. Um, but it was it was you know this was a 9/11 scale of, style of event um, uh, in Japan. And the original plan for the final climax of Evangelion was for Sile to invade Nerve using poison gas and flood these concrete tunnels with basically Nerve gas to kill everyone. Nope. Nope. Not going to do that. Nope. That's not going to be the plot anymore. <laughs> Guess what? They decided not to do that. So, yeah. Um, sudden need to completely um, to take, take a, a slightly different turn, a slightly different approach with their ending. Now, this has been um, this has been kind of a legendary story that's been passed around a lot, and in, um, in, the, in recent years, some of the folks have kind of come out and said, okay, let me, let me kind of explain where all that, you know, where we were. Um, first off, people have said that they were kind of out of money, and so they decided to take this, to, to, to make the, the end episodes of Evangelion like very psychological, very thoughtful, and thus they have no action sequences. And they're like, no, we were low on money. We had less money than we thought we would, but we were not like destitute. Um, you know, budgets were just lower than we, than we wanted. And we had always planned to do a more psychological ending, um, to include psychological elements, but we were also going to have a, you know, a big apocalyptic action ending. And so what we ended up doing was just basically cutting all of that stuff, all of the action stuff, and expanding all of the psychological stuff that we planned to do. So it wasn't like they just, you know, literally dumped four episodes worth of material in the trash and wrote it all with this new idea on, on psychology. But either way, the ending of Evangelion was a thing. <laughs> it turned into this very psychological, thoughtful, weird ending. So, what was the result in Japan? Well, Evangelion made all the money. Um, depending on who you asks, asked, um, and this is all quoted on the Wikipedia article, um, Evangelion merchandising exceeded $400 million by 1997. Within two years, they made four hundred million dollars. Well, they sold four hundred million dollars worth of Evangelion merch. Um, um, by two thousand six, Matt Greenfield, Matt Greenfield estimated the franchise had earned two billion dollars in a decade, uh, U.S. dollars. Um, uh, two thousand seven estimate um, um, placed total sales of related goods at one and a half billion dollars. Um, by twenty fifteen. Um, it was over 700 billion yen, so about $7 billion um, in, in all that stuff, because of Pachinko. Uh, but that's a whole other story, which we can get to later, if you all are curious about that. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a big deal. Um, they, Evangelion made tons of money. So Gainax stayed afloat. They were able to, st to stick around. And that meant that we were going to get more Evangelion. <laughs> like they're not going to, you know, they're not going to just let that die away. Um, this is going to keep on going. Um, I, I think it was Ano who said, uh, or it may have been um, um, a Takeda who said, uh, the thing about Evangelion is it wouldn't stop making money. <laughs> like, you know, we couldn't not make money off that if we tried. So, fair enough. Um, um, now, fans hated the ending, even in, in Japan. Um, that was not a, a popular ending at all. Some people like under like appreciated it, but it was still not a popular ending. But guess what? Controver uh, controversy, controversy, or controversy. Sorry, controversy keeps attention going. It 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 keeps popularity going. Controversy means people are talking about you, and it lets you keep on going. Certain well-known media figures of the past few years have proved this. So, you know, whether the ending was ideal or not, it had the effect of keeping the conversation going for years thereafter. And people debating the ending, debating what, um, you know, what happened, why it happened, why this, why this frame in this shot of this thing just kept on going and kept on going and kept on going, even with the release of new movies. 
Um, so let's also look at America, because that's where I am. That's where many of you are. Why is it a big deal over here? Well, by the, um, by the time Eva came out over here in America in the late 90s, American anime fandom had become, I wouldn't call it big, but I, it, it was an industry. Like, there were people making a living selling anime merchandise, right? There, there, were, there were companies that sold anime stuff for a living. So there was actual, like, money going around. Um, and so that industry was kind of primed, right? There, there's this big show coming out, and, uh, you know, we're kind of here to support it. So it wasn't going to just kind of come out and then just kind of disappear. Um, the, the pump was primed, so to speak, for Evangelion to come out, which is cool. The problem was, nobody in America watched Mecca. Um, Mecca was just this kind of dead genre in America. It was not a huge, it was not a, a really a huge part of things. Gundam had not really kicked off. Now, Gundam Wing had been a success on Toonami, but that was kind of an exception. Right? People were fans of Gundam Wing, they were not fans of Gundam, really. Um, and it wasn't really expanding to other things. Robotech, obviously, was a huge, huge, huge thing in the 80s. But that had, those fans had kind of moved on, right? That, that, was, that was the old generation. This is the new generation. So people weren't really... So Evangelion made a splash in, over here, but it wasn't Attack on Titan. It wasn't Naruto. Um, and so it kind of remained this cult classic that not everybody had seen, which meant people were, were telling other people about this show. Oh, have you heard of Evangelion? Oh, you should check it out. It looks really weird. So, again, kind of that, that conversation is churning constantly because it's not something that everyone's tired and exhausted of seeing memes of, right? At least in America at the time. And it stayed in the discussion. I don't think there is a single anime convention you can go to in America that does not have an Evangelion panel somewhere happening at that convention. It is just a constant in, you know, in, in anime fandom that people love to talk about this show. And that is one of the things that kind of helped keep, helped keep it alive, helps keep it alive. Um, that is really, you know, the big thing there. Kind of like this convention and this panel, <laughs> which is a panel about Evangelion at a convention, right? Like, th that's the thing, right? It just stays ever, uh, you know, going forever. Um, so, now that we've come full circle, that's the deal with Evangelion. Um, that is really kind of what I wanted to get across. Does anyone in the chat have any questions about what I've just talked about? I will be happy to talk through them. Now that I've been talking for a, a very long time. Um, unfortunately, YouTube doesn't really allow for um, asking questions at a good pace. So I can ask a question partway through the, 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 the presentation, but then it's kind of like, I have to wait 15 seconds <laughs> to see all the responses. Like, oh, yeah. Um, otherwise, I'd love to get your, your thoughts as we're going. But yes, um, um, yeah, that, you know, it, it's basically the false religious cult that we got at the end of Evangelion. Um, what's the future of even now that the movies are over? Excellent question. Um, so, <laughs> Anno famously um, released a poster uh, for 3.01.0 saying, bye bye all of Evangelion, uh, which I think very much summed up his feelings at the time. I firmly believe that Hideaki Anno is, at the moment, finished with Evangelion. He's, he doesn't want, he, he's told, he's done everything he wants to do with that, that franchise, he's told all the stories, he doesn't need to come back to Evangelion. That does not mean we will not get any more Evangelion. I believe we will get plenty more Evangelion, other folks will come in, people will pitch things, stuff and so forth and so on, but I doubt that we're going to see like a mainline Evangelion TV series in five years. Right, I think we're just kind of we're we're we're, we're the, you know directed by Anno. Um, I can foresee side stories told in that universe. Son of Shinji. Son of Shinji. Yes, absolutely. Um, with whom? I wonder. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what I want to see. I want to see cooking with the Akaris. <laughs> you know, if we can have that fate stay night cooking with the whatever family show. We can do that with, and set in the, spoiler alert, like the, 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 the post-rebuild movies universe, like that whole thing, that, just give me that, 
That's that would be yes, please. I will take twenty four episodes of that. I'm very very happy. Um, so yeah, that's the that's that's the thing there. Um, what a great question. Do the modern Eva movies capture the mood of Japan today? Oh. Wow. Um, what is the mood of the modern Eva movies? Yeah. Um, so the modern Eva movies are, um, they serve a couple of purposes. One is, let's be honest, making money, right? There's very much a, this is a franchise, we want to keep the franchise alive. What, what do we do to do that? Um, it is also to kind of repair the storyline of Evangelion. It is Anno coming back and saying, okay, I was not able to tell the story the way I wanted to in the past, but also I can't go, I can't travel back in time and change that. I'm not going to try to, like, you know, remake that frame by frame. Um, so what is the story that I would tell now with those characters and all that kind of stuff? Um, so there's that going on there. Um, it is also very much a story of, of uncertainty. I mean, Shinji is just lost throughout all of those movies. Um, and it's not really until the... Halfway through the last one, really? That he, he starts to, to really come into his own? Um, so, yeah, I would say... Because right... Mm, well, and again, I don't want to psychoanalyze a, a, an entire culture. Um, it seems to me, certainly, Japan is... doesn't feel as lost as it did in 1995, right? Um, um, just history has, you know, time has spent enough time to say, okay, we're, everything's okay. Everything's better than it was back then. Um, there's still, certainly, I've, I've, I've read a fair number of, like, stories and articles and angst from folks of saying, is, you know, in Japan, saying, have we recovered? Like, what's going to happen in the future? Um, but that's a really good question. I'm, I'm actually going to punt. I don't know that we can analyze that close. I, I, don't think, I don't think we have enough perspective to know if it's capturing the zeitgeist or not. Um, just because we don't know ourselves well enough <laughs> about, you know, um, how people are feeling. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, actually getting back to the early question about the future of Eva, I think one of the interesting things about that, that franchise is it might be a franchise that is not eternal. Um, that had its day in the sun and is not going to be a huge thing forever. It will still be a, you know, a notable franchise. There'll still be stuff going on. But it could be that it's kind of like, you know, peaked in 1990, we had all these rebuild movies, and now it's going to kind of not fade away completely, but just, you know, go back to that kind of the pachinko machines and video games are still making money and the merchandise is still churning along. But we don't... And the, this, this is the thing. The franchise has proved that we don't need constant Eva anime or Eva manga to keep the franchise, you know, chugging along at, at a nice background level. So it might just be, okay, yeah, this is just a thing, and every so often we'll come back to it, but eh, we'll see. Um, kind of like Macross, actually. Like, yeah. You know, Macross just has its ups and downs and whatever. It will um, be forever known, perhaps not always watched. But forever yes, known. exactly. Forever known, necessarily forever watched. So uh, we'll see. I don't know. Um... Any other questions? Um, um, <laughs> uh, appreciate all of that. Yeah. Um, and I should also point out, again, Eva is kind of a weird thing, and there are many, many factors involved. That, that panel was not meant to say, here's, this explains everything. It just, here's some of the major factors. Um, you know, lots of folks are into Eva because they, they love Asuka. You know, and Asuka's their thing. Fair enough, right? There, there's really plenty of people who uh, um, get into something for, you know, just one little thing. Um, whatever. Yes, sir. Oh, question, yes. question. Yes, yes. Um, so, one of the things that I get off of, uh, oh, that's a wrong way to put it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I get, um, come on over here, Steve. Just come, okay. come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, one of the things that I've always thought about, let me see if I can yeah. squeeze in here. One of the things that are, oops, oops. Yep. I about Evangelion is that mm. I never, I, when I first watched it, I never identified it as a mecha movie. Or a mecha, oh, mecha yeah. Mecha series. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is would you all think that it would be its own genre? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah, it has yeah. a mecha element to it, but is it its right. own genre? Is it, is it really mecha? Is it is it really, or is it, you know, kind of something else? God, I got totally thrown off by that picture. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, 
I was like, oh my god, really? All those people? No. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you know, you have you, you have Evangelion that that this this thing, this is this monster of an anime, mm-hmm. obviously. But is it Mecha? Is it yeah. or, or is it its own thing? Because Macross, when you think about Macross, mm-hmm. one of the, one of the enduring things about it, the, the reason why people still know what it is, yeah. is that it's its own thing. Mm. And it's been its mm-hmm. own thing for a long time. Mm-hmm. So do you think Evangelion would be kind of like its own? Like, okay, we have the Mecha, we have Pat Layer, Gundam, yeah. blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah. Over here, Evangelion. You know, it's, it's yeah. something else. And I, I completely agree. I yeah. think in, in a lot of... And I think it's, that's also kind of intentional because it is such a riff on yeah. different things. It is like, oh, um, you know, biological mecha that are also technically people. Spoilers. Um, you know. Um, people. <laughs> who also turn into goo. Um, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very distinct universe. And that also comes out, um, another uh, thing people don't kind of quite grasp, I think, about a lot of Gainax shows is that these are old school like sci-fi fantasy fans, right? Oh, Where yeah. you are expected to be, like we're talking, you know, um, um, creating your own fantasy worlds, you know, on graph paper on the weekends. Um, you're expected to be very inventive and and to be to be um, immersing yourself in new worlds all the time. So there's that aspect of well, if I'm going to make a mecha series, I'm going to make it entirely my own. And it's going to be its own weird thing, um, and that's fine. Like that, that is just kind of the the nature of things. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, um, I talked to somebody about Revolutionary Girl Utna. Oh, yeah. And I said, is that a Metro Girl series? I don't know. Like, I don't know what, how you categorize that show. <laughs> like, like, Good point. I don't yeah, think it yeah, is yeah. anything. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because yeah. I don't even think of, of Utna. Kind of getting yeah. off topic. But yeah. Utna as a magical girl. I'm just like going to think of the other aspects of, of yeah. Utna. I'm just like going, oh, yeah. There's <laughs> like, because I think Revolutionary Girl Utna is... Um, playing off of magical girl archetypes, right? Right. Like they're, they're, obviously they're very magical girl esque things to it, right. but it's not really a magical girl show. Right. So it's, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think it's definitely one of those weird things. Um, I completely agree with you, Lachonsky. I could do a new Gundam series every year. Please, just just do that again. Um, do you prefer the manga, the show, or the movies? Ooh. I may get canceled over this. Um, <laughs> I, this is not necessarily going to be a popular thing. I prefer the rebuild movies. Um, to me, those encapsulated a version of the story in a very satisfying way, especially once you get to the end. Um, and that is uh, that just kind of really worked for me. The TV series is um, loved it until I'm, I'm one of the people who, who at the end I was just like. Hate. Hate. <laughs> but then I watched the rebuild, mm-hmm. and and you you saw my well you all saw my reaction. I'm yeah. just like going, cautionally optimistic. Please don't go there. Please don't go there. Okay, good, good. Yeah, like <laughs> pins and needles, pins and needles yeah. the whole time. Um, don't have that scene. We right, know the don't, scene. Don't, don't, don't do, do that, that scene. scene. Don't, don't, please, not, don't do that. Um, but yeah, but no, I I think I agree with you. I think yeah. the rebuild it, it gave yes yeah, more satisfying. Mm-hmm. It was uh, you know ending even though the, the original tv series is amazing right it, yeah it, it, yeah, it is yeah. amazing and anybody out there who mm-hmm. has, has seen mm-hmm. the original series should see it mm-hmm. and yes put yourself through the torture of watching the last couple of episodes because <laughs> that'll make you appreciate the rebuild all mm-hmm. more, honestly. absolutely and i have not read a lot of the manga um, what i read of the manga is fun in a sense that like it's it's very much sadamoto just saying just saying okay what is the version of this that we would have made through my lens, which is not as hopped up on medication as Anno's was when he was making the show? Um, I, I, I kid. And, um, Anno was dealing with a lot through the show, but a lot of it has been made of that. The, the idea being that he was like, you know, high on cocaine, you know, eight hours a day. Like, no, that, that's a bit much. Um, but yeah. Um, I heard the Eva show and movies are on the same timeline as um, as they are stuck in a time loop. Is that true? That is debatable. The, the um, you from what I've mm, I think there is sufficient evidence to say that the rebuild movies are technically a sequel to the original TV series, and it is absolutely a time loop that you're seeing. The, the, you, you know, this is more Eva stuff. But you can, you know, you can, you can, you can do that. Um, yeah, the, the, the manga I, I, I enjoyed. 
Um, but full disclosure, it's one of those things where I was like, this is fun. But it didn't like suck me back in to say, I need to know what's going to happen in the ending. Right. right? So who knows? Um, um, Future Boy says, every nation goes through aging process as humans do during the three golden... Um, um, age anime, Japan, 70s, 80s, and 90s, seem anime hasn't captured the magic that once had after. Well, it's evolved, right? Anime today is not what it was back then. Um, um, you know, you're not going to see a show exactly like Evangelion again because the pressures were diff are different. Yeah. And just people want different things now than they wanted um, in the past. Moe anime is a good example where people wanted a relaxing... They wanted an anime they could just kind of relax into in the Moe era, something that wasn't, you know, intellectually challenging, intellectually stimulating, because that was the zeitgeist at the time. Um, and now kind of shifting back into, into a time of, of more, some more challenging anime. Um, the 90s were very much, and this is, you actually see this in, in comic fandom, mm, I think, as yeah. well, where the, the, the idea was is to hit hard with your characters and mm -hmm. your designs, not just in the story, but uh, in your designs as well. I mean, yep. if you look at, like, some of the Marvel heroes of the 90s it, you know big shoulders you know body to <laughs> the kind of thing and you know just very you know mm -hmm. brooding and intense spawn and, yeah 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 <laughs> and evangelion was was kind of like that you know, mm -hmm. it, it yeah. really did like you were saying earlier it perfectly encapsulated that that idea of what was going on in japan at the time and that feeling of just like oh no, no, no. Mm. Mm. what is the I can't even figure out the next five minutes. I can't even <laughs> think about tomorrow just yet, okay? So let's, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. But the 90s was very much a different, you know, everything was slam bam, you know, action. Let's yeah. hit it hard and do all this stuff. And then nowadays we have Euro Camp. Right. You know, <laughs> the lovely Euro Camp. Mm -hmm. How about that for a whiplash? You watch five episodes <laughs> of Evangelion, then you go into the Euro Camp. Maybe you need Euro Camp after watching five episodes. I want a Euro Camp Evangelion show now. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a nightmare. <laughs> Let's go camping in the body of Angel 28. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. Horrible. Horrible. Um, manga made sense to you in areas where the anime did not. Yeah, makes sense. I, I, I can totally see what that would be. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Lachonsky, that there's, there is no one ending of Evangelion, um, which, is, which is ironically a benefit. Because you can always go back to that well. You can always right. change things and, and have a different perspective about it. And, and you can say, I don't like that. This is how my ending would have, would have gone. Um, you know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the problems, um, not one of the problems, but one of the situations that, like, the, the long-running Shonen series, they, they, they can't end. Right. right? They, yeah, they don't yeah, want yeah. to give you a definitive ending, so you're kind of stuck there. I'm just reminded of the, uh, speaking of not ending, mm. writing a fanfic of... Uh, was Tenchu Moya crossing over with the, the Evangelion universe <laughs> that saved the world? And okay. They all have a dinner at the at, at the at the uh, Tenchu. You know, it's like mm. a household, and it, everything just goes wrong. <laughs> I believe it that. Goes wrong. I believe that. But see, it'll never end. Not even fan Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely not. Um, um, it's one of the special things about Evangelion is that it has become kind of the little engine that could, little anime that could, where it's like. It, it can't stop making money. It can't stop um, causing controversy. It can't stop people making telling stories about it. It is just there's something special about it that keeps people coming back to that. It is at a, at a convention. I will tell you this: at a convention, if there's somebody that mm. you want to have an icebreaker with, yeah, that's, that's mm. the perfect. Mm -hmm. Evan what are your thoughts? Yeah, mm -hmm. funny you should ask. <laughs> Let me spend, spend the next five mm -hmm. hours with you and talk right. about this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yep. It is, it is one of those things. Um, so, yeah. If you want to get into Evangelion, um, this is often a question I get, like, where do you start? Um, I advise people now to watch the um, um, the first Rebuild movie and then the first few episodes of the TV series. Because um, they, they, they follow basically the same... Um, yeah. They cover the same ground. And watch that and, and decide for yourself... Which of these am I willing, you know, which of these kind of speaks to me more? Do I want kind of the episodic nature of the TV series? Do I appreciate kind of the, the condensation of the movies? And then when you go there, you can say, okay, I'm going to do the, re the rebuild movies or I'm going to do the TV series um, and, uh, and, and go in that direction. Because it is, like, like you said, it is definitely valuable to have seen the original TV series and know what happened there. Um, 
but that's not necessarily the version of it that you're going to enjoy the most. <laughs> so just be aware of that, right? It's, it's its own it's its own thing. Um, it's thoughts a on trap. yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on Boko Rano? I have not managed to watch more than a few episodes of Boko Rano. Um, for those unfamiliar, Boko Rano is a an anime series, um, also a manga, um, where a bunch of kids are roped into piloting a, a giant robot to um, uh, to fight off sort of um, various monsters without realizing. And this is all again sort of you know back of the book blurb stuff that. Um, the, the robot is powered with their life force, and every battle means that one of the kids dies. Um, like, not like win or lose. Like, one of the kids will die at the end of that battle. So, um, especially for me, that's a very tough premise to watch through. Um, I have a soft spot, a soft spot for kids. So, um, that said, Boku Rano is very much an Evangelion inspired anime series. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of those shows where it's like, okay, you're clearly taking kind of these themes and this kind of kind of approach to anime. And we did get a few of those. Um Argentosoma. Did you yeah. ever see Argentosoma or no, ever heard of it? No. Um it's a it is one of the most clearly like we just watched Evangelion, we're gonna make that <laughs> again kind of a show. Um goes off its own direction. Some some very interesting stuff in Argentosoma. Um but um, you know, weird alien creatures and you know, mysterious, massively funded you know mecha um, uh, group and all that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of that stuff going on. Um, Netflix over OG dub. Um, I like both. Um, yeah, yeah I, I didn't really have a problem with with either of them. Yeah. Um, um, I, I will say that the uh, the, the, uh, the person who does the new Shinji did a an amazing job. job. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, yeah. and I mean, that is a, that, those are very difficult. That's a very difficult role, A, because you're, you're acting somebody with kind of flat affect. Mm -hmm. um, and B, especially in the rebuild movies, oh, yeah. you know, Shinji goes in a lot of directions as those movies go along, where he's just kind of, you know, bouncing back and forth kind of emotionally. And getting that across and not feeling like, you know, you're portraying somebody who is just a complete basket case. Well, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, it's just very impressive. Um, again, not that, not that the original uh, voice actor didn't do that, but just I was like, wow, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's impressive. Um, tough work. Tough work. Um, also, and we talked about this, you know, we are not people who... You know, bleed through the ears when we hear, you know, a dub that's not perfect. It's like, eh, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. whatever. Mm. Actually, bad dubs are quite entertaining. Is this true? Is this true? Quite entertaining. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, they have, they have their, their pros and cons. Like anything, right? <laughs> like, like any anime, there's there's pluses and minuses. Except Yokohama Kadashi Kiko. That's perfect. Quite Country Cafe, that's the, there's no flaws in that. But, you know, everything else. Um... But yeah. Can, can you tell what he likes? I can, can you yeah. Tell? Could, 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 could you possibly? <laughs> um, <laughs> Lane has no flaws. No wait, Lane has a lot of flaws. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I love you know when folks, you know, yeah. You get the occasional folks who talks about shows like Lane, where they're like, "Wow, like it's amazing all the kind of stuff it does." And it's like, "That was a really cheap show." I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, there are a lot of things where it's like that does that that person's kind of walking on water there. Like that person isn't moving right. Like that's just they, they just. Nah. Um, but oh well. Um, thoughts on Razafon and the, uh, the uh, comparison to Eva? I've only seen the first episode, I think, of Razafon. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you can totally see that. People have called Razafon uh, Evangelion done right this time. Um, which is unfair, but um, it is definitely, um, it definitely came across to me as the kind of show where they internalized the, um, they internalized the mistakes and issues with Evangelion, you know, intentional or otherwise, right? Things happen. Um, and we're like, okay, we, won't, we at least won't do that. Right, yeah. Um, and so um, everything I've seen of it has really impressed me, uh, of Razavan, of being this, 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 uh, um, of managing to tell its own story um, while also using kind of that, those, those 
those ingredients of Evangelion um, without just feeling like the same flavor. So, cool. Thank you all. We're going to take a quick, quick, quick break. We will be back in um, about 20 minutes with Steve's first panel, Japanese albums that should be on your playlist that aren't Bebop OST 1. Um, meantime, we are going to take a quick break um, with some other uh, Japan travel videos. So let us do that. Absolutely. So we will switch over to that right now. I'm having some slight computer issues at the moment. So if things are a little choppy, be aware of that. Um, but uh, yeah, we will be back in a little while. <laughs> 